Noticing any effects of breathing mindfully. And if you'd like, you can continue breathing mindfully. If that's a useful way for you to practice mindfulness. And another option, if for whatever reason, breathing mindfully isn't working for you, in some ways a more obvious, concrete anchor for awareness is the sensations in the body. We can feel both what we could call external sensations, so the air on the skin, the butt touching the cushion or the chair, the hands touching the knees or wherever they're placed. So this external contact, the skin making contact with the air or the clothes. And also internally, we can feel maybe pressure in the body, energy moving, feelings of tightness or constriction or openness, relaxation in the muscles and the joints. So this whole field of mindfulness of the body as we're sitting is also a great option for cultivating mindfulness. Just whatever sensations we feel when we turn our attention to the body sitting Not looking for anything in particular, just receiving, receiving the sensations of sitting, if that's what we choose to work with, to receive, to attune to. And one third option, last option, is to tune in, to be receptive to hearing. So the field of hearing sounds coming and going, arising and passing. Simply to settle back, relax, and receive the sounds as they come and go. Being aware in an ordinary, relaxed way. of this field of hearing. So perhaps one of these three options, mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of body sensations, or mindfulness of hearing, is already a comfortable um, anchor for you. Something that's easy to connect with and that your mind is finds useful and interesting. So I'd invite you to work with one of these three <coughs> as a primary anchor and that doesn't mean that we won't know other experiences, thoughts, other physical sensations, sounds, 
will be aware of probably many different things. <coughs> but we can use this primary anchor as a place to build momentum. Something simple that the mind can attend to in a relaxed way. Not needing to be too tight or fixated, focused, but emphasizing the receptivity. The breathing is already happening. Sensations are happening. Sounds are happening. We're just sort of tuning our mind or aiming our mind, opening our mind in a particular direction, staying attuned. So let's continue in silence, doing the best we can to cultivate an ongoing, relaxed interest in this capacity of the mind to be receptive, to know what's being known moment by moment.
And for the last minute of the meditation, if your eyes have been closed, you might want to practice with your eyes open, releasing the intention to be aware of the primary anchor and noticing maybe some momentum of mindfulness that can simply receive whatever is predominant, whatever the mind's already knowing without making personal effort. Feel free to stretch your legs, stand if you'd like. Feel free to greet your neighbor. If you're on Zoom, feel free to wave or say hi in the chat or or even out loud if you want. So once again, my name is Gabe Keller Flores. Really happy to be here with everyone on this dark November night here in Minnesota. Um, Tonight, I want to talk about mindfulness, which is a pretty central topic in, in Buddhism. And maybe if you've been practicing a while, you might, um, we might think that we've heard all that we need to hear about mindfulness. But uh, for me, uh, I was on a retreat recently, just a self retreat, mostly at our retreat property in Wisconsin. And I was, uh, finding myself getting interested in mindfulness as a way of knowing, which is maybe the title of this talk, mindfulness as a way of knowing. And when I think about it that way, it it feels a lot more interesting because I noticed on my retreat, just a lot of tendency to get lost in thought and in particular, Um, kind of on some obsessive trains of thought and just really didn't seem to be leading anywhere useful or or new, just kind of these, um, yeah, repetitive thoughts. And then the moments, it was so contrasted with moments of mindfulness where there was almost felt like a completely different reality of um, the present moment, you know, the unfolding nature of the body and mind uh, and an aliveness there, a freshness of kind of the unknown too. Because when we're, when we're practicing mindfulness, we're sort of at the edge of the known. You know, we can know something when we're mindful. We can know that 
this moment is like this, you know, the body feels like this, the mind feels like this, the heart feels like this, whatever words we might use, um, but we're really connecting with our direct experience. But that's, you know, we, we have to use language, and so I'm using nouns like our direct experience, but in our direct experience, you know, sometimes I know Mark will sometimes use the gerund tense instead. So like experiencing, you know. So anyways, these are just words that are pointing to our direct experience and its unfolding nature. And there's an inherent aliveness in that that is different than the world of thoughts. So that's what I want to um, talk about. So mindfulness as a way of knowing is a way of knowing something. And to contrast that with our more maybe habitual or just common way of knowing, which is conceptual knowing, um, which on the surface seems a lot more real and concrete, you know, like we all probably know that it's Wednesday and we probably all know that we're at common ground, but, you know, and that seems pretty concrete or we all like know I'm Gabe and you know, you're you. And so that can all feel pretty, pretty concrete, but actually if we peel back any of that, it actually starts to seem maybe pretty contingent, you know, and based on convention and, and language. Today's only Wednesday because yesterday was Tuesday and tomorrow is Thursday. And if for some reason the world decided they needed two Wednesdays in a row, then they would have to make a big announcement and tomorrow would be Wednesday and we would have to say today's Wednesday, but yesterday was also Wednesday. So it's all based on, it's all based on, yeah, you know, these things that we can take for granted that can seem so, so real, you know, they're mostly labels kind of shorthand. And that's just what the human mind is really good at, you know, shorthand, because otherwise it would take a lot of time, to, you know, to look at a cushion and have to figure out what it is every time, you know, we can just look at it. Oh, that's a cushion. I know what to do, sit on it. Um, but if we live our whole lives in that shorthand, if we think that's all that life is, then it becomes very two dimensional. So we could think of mindfulness as opening up another dimension, really. So it doesn't negate the conceptual, you know, concepts but it opens up this, yeah. Uh, I think I, I was just reading this new book um, called Saving Time. I don't know if anyone's read it or heard of it uh, by Jenny O'Dell, who wrote uh, one of my favorite books called How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy. Came out in 2020, I think. And this is her new book, Saving Time. And it's all about time. I just started it, um, kind of how we think about time. But, and she was using these two Greek words. So chronos, uh, sort of chronological time, linear time. So that's kind of maybe more on the level of conceptual, you know, today, tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday. It's just, and it's all in discrete units, right? We look at our Google calendar and, you know, one block of one hour is no different than the next. It's just kind of this sequence of moments. And then this other Greek word, kairos, which I don't quite, I don't quite remember, to be honest, what, you know, everything she said about it. But it, at one point, she said something about like, horizontal time and vertical time. So, you know, conceptually, we think time is just, yeah, you know, from an objective standpoint, it's just every moment is the same. It's just tick, tick, tick. But in our direct experience, you know, some moments feel like they really drag on and some moments feel like they're really, we really inhabit them and we can, you know, we might not remember or really be present for any 
of the 10 or 15 minutes it takes to drive us home. But, you know, two or three moments on a meditation retreat, maybe when we're just really present, we might remember more of those moments even years later because we were really present with them. So just the sense that, um, that our experience is subjective and this is what mindfulness is for. It's for our subjective experience to illuminate that because it's in our subjective experience that suffering arises and suffering ceases. And this is really the point of the whole Buddha's, of all the Buddha's teachings is to illuminate that experience. And it can be tricky because there are a lot of teachings and we can read them and we can even have an intellectual understanding about you know, things the Buddha said about suffering and it can make a lot of sense. But it's really, all of the teachings are, are meant to, you know, help us be with our own experience and maybe be with it in a new way. And, and I think a lot of the teachings are really just ways to kind of shake us up and kind of break our habitual entrancement with just the word, you know, the, the world of our assumptions and ideas. Because no matter how we think of ourselves or the world, most of us are pretty convinced that we already know sort of what the world and our life and I am. And yeah, maybe there's some variations here and there, but most of us, I think, have, don't have, uh, don't live every day kind of with a sense of wonder or, um, yeah, freshness. At least that's how it is for me. I can't speak for anyone else. But these teachings and the, these practices, uh, really because they're, they're always pointing us back to our own experience, where, and they're sort of also um, giving us some hints, like, like the changing nature of experience, that that's relevant. Um, and the suffering, you know, suffering and, and the end of suffering. So these, these aspects of experience that we can only really be in touch with in this subjective way. You know, we can read a book, a novel or whatever, you know, great nonfiction book and be entertained and, and be edified and learn. But it's only in coming into contact with our own direct experience that we learn about our direct experience, which is where, again, suffering happens and the uh, release from suffering happens. So this, you know, it's, um, in a way it's obvious, but it can be surprising how little maybe we feel inspired or curious about turning to our direct experience in this really open, fresh way. So the Buddha really did emphasize direct experience. And, um, you know, maybe we can think a little bit about what, what that means. And I would say it's whatever we can know know for ourselves. So direct experiential knowledge. And that might seem obvious on the surface, but there's a lot I think that we tend to assume. So I think a lot of mindfulness practice is getting to know what mindfulness is, what awareness is, as opposed to just thinking about things, thinking about myself or my life, thinking about being mindful, being the present moment. So to be aware of what's being known as it's being known, or to be aware of what's happening as it's happening as a process, it's a different skill. It's a, and if, if, it's, if, if we're new to it, or even if we're not new to it, it should, I think, have a bit of a feeling of otherworldliness. Any moment of mindfulness where there's, the mind is remembering or realizing that it has this reflective capacity, not just to 
be involved in the activity of the mind, but to reflect on it, to you know, consider it, to kind of feel it, to taste it, maybe like, what is this? What is this like? What does this feel like? And I think this is important that this point that the Buddha was always directing us to our own direct experiential knowledge, what we can know. I think it, um, I think for one, it, it's empowering because nobody can tell us what our direct experience is. So only we can know, you know, what suffering feels like in this heart, what the release of suffering feels like, or if suffering is too strong a word, just, you know, what stress feels like in this heart and body, what's, what the absence of stress feels like, and what it feels like, and also, you know, um, how it happens, how it arises, how it ceases. And... Um, and I think it's also helpful that it, it, it also clarifies sort of what, what the Buddha was teaching and why he was teaching it, because it's easy, because our minds are so primed to think of things conceptually, and, and not just to think of things conceptually, but also to cling to views about reality, religious views, metaphysical views, World, views about the world, views about, our, views about ourselves. Uh, this is something the Buddha talked about a lot. Our tendency to, instead of this kind of vulnerable uh, meeting of life as it is, and kind of learning from our direct experience, to kind of avoid that exposure to the dynamic changing uncertain nature of experience as it's unfolding and just kind of have a view, you know, any fundamentalist view or just any view that we, we cling to. Even a view as, you know, it can really be anything. And the big one is self-view. So an assumption that this is happening to me, whatever this is, it's, it, the universe revolves around me that whatever's happening, it, it um, yeah, there's somebody here, that, an agent and also a subject. And, you know, what that, what effects that assumption has then, well, if there's a me here that's doing stuff and having stuff done to me, that's kind of a, kind of a vulnerable position to be in kind of just inherently this self view kind of inherently has uh, yeah separation or if there's a me here that's different than what I'm experiencing out there And it's interesting around self-view, which is, I don't know, a confusing topic in Buddhism. But it's interesting that the Buddha actually never said there was no self, which is sometimes what people say. But when he was asked categorically by somebody at the Buddhist time, there was a lot of very vibrant religious and philosophical scene and people talking about the nature of the universe. Is the universe eternal? Is it infinite? Is it finite? Is the self eternal? So yeah, it's just a very, uh, yeah, a lot going on in, in the religious and philosophical scene and a lot of people kind of promulgating views. And so anyways, there's often stories about people approaching the Buddha and sort of asking him what he taught and sometimes just seems like looking for an argument or really trying to pin down you know, what, what are you teaching? What are your views on, on these philosophical subjects? And the, it's really interesting to see how the Buddha would answer some of these things because his um, approach and his intention was always pragmatic, which for me inspires a lot of confidence and 
yeah, it's always what I've appreciated about about this these teachings is, is their pragmatism, which I also, you know, another word for that for me is, you know, the compassion behind them. You know, the Buddha, what the Buddha saw, you know, having had his awakening no longer as as it, you know, as the story goes, no longer experiencing that stress and that suffering that's just kind of seems built into the experience of being a human being, you know, a separate human being contending with the vicissitudes of life, somehow his heart having realized something where he could still be in the world, you know, be engaged in the world, but apparently not experience that stress. Um, so it's kind of an amazing thing to try to wrap our heads around. But what, you know, from that vantage point, and he described in, in many ways sort of what that realization was about. But having had that realization, what, um, yeah, that was, you know, that was the aim when he looked about and saw people caught up in suffering, not only for themselves, but then, you know, getting attached to their views and opinions, getting attached to their things, getting attached to people, and then creating conflict in the world. And there's a lot of teachings where he makes these direct connections between the clinging and the attachment and the suffering that we experience and how that leads to, to conflict in the world as well. So again, so just his approach was always pragmatic and compassionate. So in a, in a, opposed to metaphysical, like coming up with a doctrine that's the one true doctrine, and now I have to convince everyone of it. It was always pragmatic. So all the teachings, even though on the surface, they might appear to be teachings about the nature of the universe or reality, they're always teachings about the nature of experience, our direct experience, or they're pointers for us to check out in our own direct experience to see whether it, it has a uh, an effect that's useful, that's leading in the direction of less stress and suffering. And that includes the teachings on not self. So the teachings on not self aren't a doctrine that there is no self. And, and to go back to that story, when this person came and asked kind of categorically, does the Buddha, do you say there's a self or do you say there's not a self? The Buddha just didn't answer these, this person's questions because it wouldn't have been helpful. So the question with self and not self is just when, when is that activity of selfing, when might that be useful, you know, like to uh, have a sense of self that, and, and the Buddha did talk about this at times, like to rely on ourselves, you know, to have a, a sense of self, you know, a sense of morality and ethics and a sense of, you know, whatever, what, what we're committed to, that's that's wholesome that's onward leading so in that conventional way we could say yeah we we, we want to develop self-reliance we want to develop um, wholesome qualities and then another at other times uh, the strategy or the perspective of looking at our experience and asking is there any element of what i'm calling myself that actually qualifies to be called self? Do I actually ever find a self? Or do I just have a habit of ascribing thing, ascribing self or mine or possession, you know, my emotion? How is my emotion so different from anyone else's? You know, when I experience anger, isn't that just the nature of anger and not so different from when you experience anger? Obviously, it's, you know, it's something that, that I feel or you know, conventionally it's happening here, but in what sense is it personal like to Gabe and even you know, elements of you know, my biography or just whatever I could say, well, yeah, no, that's, that's really gay, but isn't that too just contingent? Like there's not one piece that's sort of an essence that I find. And this is just something not to believe, but to look, look at, to investigate 
with the, with the mind of how does this, um, yeah, how does this affect suffering and the end of suffering? So I experience more suffering when I'm angry and I think this is my anger than when I experience anger and I think this is the nature of anger. So that's, that's the purpose of the teachings on not self, it's not to believe in anything because believing in not self could be just as problematic, maybe even more problematic than believing in self. I believe I have no self, so then nothing I do matters or has any consequence. In the traditional Theravada teachings, there's four stages of awakening, and the first one, and different fetters, there's 10 fetters, and different fetters are uprooted at the four different stages. And the first stage is called stream enter. So you've sort of entered the stream, and you're sort of, there's no turning back. <laughs> um, and it's interesting, the, the three fetters that drop at the first stage of awakening are attachment to rites and rituals, which uh, a teacher of mine, Ajahn Suchitto, a British monk, wonderful teacher, um, translates as more broadly systems and conventions. So any sense that if I just do a certain kind of, yeah, ritualistic or just kind of going along, you know, floss my teeth every day or whatever, just things that we can sort of rely on, you know, I, or even just, yeah, habits that we have that feel good. And it's not that those things are bad, but if we think that's going to do it for me just to kind of get through life kind of with a lot of good habits, it's not, you know, those are just systems and conventions. So that's one. And then and the other is self-view, which I was just speaking about. So kind of just a real, like a, a belief that, that this person I call me is really real. Uh, there's really an essence or, or somebody here like Gabe and that's really, yeah. It's really something I can, I can find and define and that I really should build my life around sort of that identity and don't you notice how identity always takes so much work and like, you know, well, now I'm into this and like, now I want you to see me this way. And I just got this sweater and I really like, like, it. like, so it's like, it's always, it's so, it's so uh, fragile, like, cause it always requires all of this because it's, it's conditioned. It's not, you know, if it was obvious and sort of had this deep essence, I wouldn't have to continually worry about it. <laughs> so anyways, that's self-view. And then the last, the third is um, skeptical doubt, sort of like not, yeah, which I think is just kind of, we all have doubt until maybe a certain point there's less doubt about that there's a path that you know leads in the direction of less suffering. So... I mention these just because I think it's somewhat related. And again, Ajahn Suchitto made this point in one talk that these three sort of have in common that they're all sort of looking for our salvation or for our meaning in views of some kind or in sort of external things. Like, well, if I just follow these steps, you know, whatever it might be, systems and conventions, get a good job, make enough money, you know, just some kind of prescribed path, I'll be good. Or if I just really find out who I am and really kind of live into that, or, you know, the skeptical doubt, like if I just keep looking, if I just keep reading books, or if I just keep exploring, you know, there might be something out there. So in the kind of abandoning of these three, there's something kind of like, uh, that where the you could say the mind or the heart is more relying on this direct experience like there's we've experienced enough through our own mindfulness 
that's not a, nothing told, you know, that we, it's not just a dependence on somebody else's words or, or teachings, but in our own direct experience, we've seen, oh yeah, bringing attention to my own direct experience, I, I learned things about suffering and the end of suffering, and there's a path, and it doesn't seem to be dependent on being anyone in particular. It's just kind of the nature of things. And so Ajahn Suchitta described this as sort of the mind and heart relying more on its own kind of developing wisdom and less on these external views. Maybe I'll just say a little bit more about, about views. I think it's, you know, and it's related, it's, it's the same point really around the direct experience and the views. And I think it's, it's easy to, um, to keep putting our kind of our faith or our hope in external views of one kind or another, like, I think it, it's hard to trust our own direct experience because I think we assume that we already know what's there. Or we assume I already know who I am or, but, um, so, and just, yeah, just that the thought that, that the freedom, the happiness we're looking for that, like we just with, you know, this heart and mind and body, kind of could un, uncover or, um, yeah, that what we're looking for is here in our own direct experience. And so just to be, um, just to be aware of the tendency to look to views of one kind or another as, um, yeah, just places where we where we cling or um, kind of put our hopes on. Like if I read again, like read enough books or have the right view, have the right conceptual understanding, then I'll be good. And this isn't to say that it's not helpful to read about Buddhism and wisdom. It can be really helpful. It can be really inspiring, and, and actually, we need it. So it's kind of a paradox. We do need the teachings to make an intervention in our habitual ways of seeing so that we then you know, turn to our own experience. And one of the things that we can see, you know, and that the teachings point to is that tendency to cling to views. So we can see that in our own direct experience. And it includes views about um, about uh, life and and um, spirituality, so even views, yeah, even views about the way things are, you know, like I was saying earlier, views around not self or whatever, so that's one question we could even ask ourselves, sort of what views do we have about this path of Buddhism or meditation, and how are we how are we relating to those views? Do we really, you know, Ajahn Sumedho, who is Ajahn Suchito's teacher, a British or an American monk, would often talk about the view that I'm an unenlightened person practicing hard to become enlightened, and just how strongly we can believe in that. Like, no, that's really the truth. So just just to see how we may, you know, in coming across, you know, these really interesting, really wise teachings, how we, we may kind of, yeah, hold on to them as an ultimate truth, as opposed to just how does this inform, yeah, my own confidence 
in my ability to look at my own experience and learn something from it. So when we use a teaching and apply it and it yields some result, that's not just the teaching, that's also our own wisdom. So I think part of what I am trying to say is kind of some understanding or some encouragement or that what, what really builds confidence is what we see in our own direct experience. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to line up exactly with what we read or use the same language, but just anything that we see and, and learn about in our own direct experience that's useful. I mean, I'm guessing a lot of us in this room have had those moments where uh, through being mindful, we've learned something really useful about our own mind, something that, that we didn't know and that having seen that keeps us from repeating uh, unhelpful um, mental or, yeah, mental patterns or, or whatever. And that's really where, where I think the deeper kind of confidence comes from. Um, here's a little section of a poem that I think is related by Alberto Cairo. Live, you say, in the present. Live only in the present. But I don't want the present. I want reality. And uh, in, in some of the teachings, the Buddha would say, don't cling to the past. Don't cling to the future. Don't cling to the present. So don't cling to the past, don't cling to the future, you know, it's maybe more, more conventional or more, we can understand what that means more easily. Don't cling to the present is really interesting. And I think it's pointing to ways that in the same way that we conceive of the past and we conceive of the future, we conceive of the present too. So we can also cling in the present. Yeah, I'm being mindful. <laughs> we could have, you know, a view like I'm meditating. And, but there's a, you know, there might be a subtle difference there between that and just a moment where we're, we're just mindful in an ordinary way. And only we can know that. So again, I'm not trying to discourage anyone from thinking about practice, thinking about the Buddha's teachings, but to be like, are we as curious about our own direct experience as we are about you know, whatever the Buddhist teachings or whatever it is that we're sort of kind of really, really interested in as a map for what to do with our life, whether that's the Buddhist teachings or whether it's, you know, some other philosophy or, you know, these kind of, um, yeah, these maps, these views that we, we adopt at different times. And it's, again, not to say that that's not useful. We need views to navigate the world, but, but in order to see our own direct experience, yeah, we, we have to, and, and in order to be at peace, you know, clinging to views can be in the way of, of peace even if it's, you know, a view that seems right. Um, I'll read this little section from one of the, the ancient uh, teachings in Pali, the Pali Canon. I think it's pointing to something similar. Having seen what can be seen, the Tathagata, which is a word the Buddha used to refer to himself, which means something like, one who is such, or one who has gone such. So it's a little bit uh, hard to translate, but sort of pointing to that, you know, sense of someone who is just who they are, you know, to say it conventionally or something like that. Mm -hmm. So having seen what can be seen, the Tathagata does not imagine the seen, does not imagine the unseen, 
does not imagine what can be seen, does not imagine on who sees. Having heard what can be heard, the Tathagata does not imagine the heard, and so on. Having sensed what can be sensed, the Tathagata does not imagine the sensed. Having cognized what can be cognized, he does not imagine the cognized. Thus bhikkhus, bhikkhus is a word for monastics, thus bhikkhus, being such like in regard to all phenomena seen, heard, sensed, and cognized, the Tathagata is such. Moreover, I declare there is no other greater or more excellent than he who is such. Whatever is seen or heard or sensed and clung to as true by others, one who is such among those self-limited wouldn't assume to be true or even false. Having already seen well that arrow to which people cling and attach, claiming, I know, I see, that's just how it is, the Tathagata, the tathagata has nothing to do with clinging. So I think there's kind of maybe two main points here. One is this sense that the, the Tathagata or anyone maybe in a moment where there's mindfulness and wisdom is seeing what's happening on that level of things happening as a process. And um, one frame that's often used in the Buddhist teachings is the six sense spaces of the five physical senses, seeing, hearing, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, and the sixth of the mind, cognizing, thinking. So that, you know, this is kind of what um, what apparently a Tathagata knows, and us when we're mindful, this is what we know. There's a, another quote I was going to read that makes this point from Saida Utejaniya, a Burmese monk, about the difference between someone who's mindful and someone who's not mindful. When a car passes by, what differentiates the meditator from the non-meditator? The meditator knows both that the car passed by and knows the experience of seeing, feeling, hearing, and interpreting the experience, thoughts or thinking mind, and so forth. The non-meditator just knows a car passing by. So it's that level of knowing the elements of our experience, you could say. So going back to that quote about the Buddha, my interpretation is that the Buddha, having known clearly, you know, these elements of experience, that it's just the, that, it's just seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting, thinking, that's what, what is being known. Then there's less of this tendency to then, well, I'm going to imagine something else, you know, to think or to feel, which is so much of our thinking, isn't it? You know, our kind of drama-fueled thinking is sort of imagining sense experiences either in the past or in the future. But when we know that these are just those elements, then maybe there's less of that tendency to imagine other ones because there's, they're already here. And then the, la the last point, the second point is that whatever is seen or heard or sensed and clung to is true by others, one who is such wouldn't assume to be true or even false. And it's interesting that this, basically I think this second point is just pointing to clinging. So the Buddha is not taking a stance on things being true or false. And it's interesting that that so sort of follows on as a corollary from the first. And I, my guess is that in that mode where we're more on the level of these six, six sense bases, just, you know, things arising and ceasing, there's less of a, a ground for me to create a strong view about any of it. You know, like I'm this way, whereas, but when I look in my direct experience, it's just these kind of elements arising and ceasing or you're always this way, you know? Whereas in our direct experience again. So just that that kind of direct way of, of experiencing 
is less likely to lead to forming a strong view and then clinging to it. You know, I know, I see, that's just how it is. The Tathagata doesn't do that. The Tathagata has nothing to do with cl- nothing to do with clinging. And I also like that it says, one who is such wouldn't assume that other people's views to be true or even false, which is what you often find, again, in the Buddha's responses to people seeking to engage him in, in argument. One person in particular came and, and said, you know, something like, what is it that you teach in kind of an aggressive way? Kind of, again, probably looking to start an argument. And the Buddha said something like, I teach a teaching whereby one doesn't get involved in quarrels or something like that. (laughs) And the person kind of like huffed and walked away because they were looking for a fight. And I think, again, this points to the, the really specific aim of the Buddha's teaching, which is, you know, described in different ways, but we could say peace. And, uh, and so this teaching on views is, it can be kind of provocative that, that it's not even, yeah, in a lot of these situations, the Buddha just isn't sort of taking a stand because not even, you know, and, and it's not to say that he never took a stand on anything. You know, he was very involved in the establishing of the monastic order and they had a lot of rules and, you know, if people did, you know, unskillful things and the Buddha tried to break up their fights. So it's not like he was passive or not, you know, engaged in the world. But on this particular point of sort of thinking that some view is worth clinging to, some abstract metaphysical or religious or philosophical view or self-identity view, that that's going to somehow um, be a source, a reliable source of happiness. The Buddha seemed to think it actually is the opposite. It leads to, you know, insecurity because now we're dependent on this view and other people may disagree with us and, and we have to keep, yeah, kind of propping it up in different ways. Gil Fransdahl, a lot of this too is influenced by Gil Fransdahl's book, The Buddha Before Buddhism, which is a translation of a early, early discourse that makes, um, kind of emphasizes in different things, but one of them is this teaching on not clinging to views. And he has one line that I really like about it. Peace doesn't rely on adopting a particular view, but it does require not clinging to views. So it's this interesting kind of middle ground. It's like you don't have to believe anything to have peace. You don't have to be a card-carrying Buddhist or say believe there's no self or whatever we might say, but it does require not clinging to views, whatever the views might be. Because if we're clinging to views, it'll, you know, there'll be some stress involved with that is the idea. And again, this isn't to say that views are bad. We need views. We really need, it's really, I think, ultimately a social thing, just a product of being social animals. We really need views and language in order to communicate, in order to get along. You know, if we didn't have any systems for how to organize ourselves, we wouldn't, you know, that's what sets in, in a way our species apart is the ability to really organize using concepts and language, you know, to organize on larger scales and hopefully do that in ways that support each other. So maybe I'll leave it here. I know I've said a lot. Um, yeah, and I hope, you know, my main point uh, of kind of, yeah, being curious about our direct experience. And as the site in which uh, suffering arises and ceases, and as the site where really our life is happening on the most direct way. And 
that we can actually, um, we have everything we need. We have all the, the tools, just, you know, we have this mind, which has this reflective capacity. And even though it, it can seem, mindfulness can seem like such an ordinary or like what's mindfulness, what's the power there? You know, just that cultivation of the ongoing interest, it's really the ongoing um, interest that can build the momentum of mindfulness where we're really, you know, with things and, and seeing things in new ways and learning and um, learning about the most, yeah, the most relevant things, how to be a human being, <laughs> which we can't really learn. We can learn some good ideas from books, and, and, but it's in, the, it's in the bringing it into practice where we learn things for ourselves, which is really different and really builds confidence that we have that, um, yeah, that capacity, which is for our own well-being and for the well-being of everyone around us to be, have a little more self-knowledge in that way. So thank you for your kind attention. Hope some of that made sense. <laughs> and uh, we have about nine minutes if anyone has comments, um, reflections from your own experience of being interested in your direct experience and what you've been learning, any questions about anything that I've said. And if you don't mind, if people in the room want to share, if you don't mind coming up here and I'll hand you the mics, that way people online can hear you, that'd be great. Or if you don't want to do that, I'll just try to summarize your, your comment. And people online, feel free to speak up and I'll um, use the mic here to try to have people here be able to hear you. So. What comes to mind for people? Yeah. I have a question and an observation. Okay, um, hang on, right? Let me get you this. The question, Gabe, I'm Ann Sheeper, would be if you would go back to your retreat at Prairie Farm in your mind or your heart and remember a moment where you really felt like, whoa, what's real here is not my conceptual mind. And maybe break it down for us, like, I want to know what happened to language where you were having thoughts about things? Did, it, did you feel like there was a, colors look different or time was different? I just kind of want to hear that so I can see. And then the other observation has to do with the meta practice in order to create a place where a person can land in the present moment, where there's not so much violence, internal, external, where there's enough love to feel safe enough to arrive. And that's sort of an observation of mine. Maybe you could comment on it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, to answer the first question, um, I think it's, yeah, it's it's kind of, I think there are moments that, you know, the one moment that I do remember where maybe this uh, this thought sort of kind of happened of sort of like, oh yeah, this is, there's a very big difference between being lost in my thoughts and being present. And it, it I was out, you know, walking in the woods, which were really beautiful. And so it was, there was kind of an incentive of like, I would actually be missing this experience if I was lost in my thoughts. So I think that had something to do with it. Like, there's a choice here. Like, it's either I'm here in the vibrancy, in the freshness, in the moment to momentness of walking through the woods, or I'm rehashing some drama, which do I prefer? And, um, and just that it's, yeah, yeah, that it, it, it felt like um, that, like the difference between conceptual reality, which is happening on that one sense door, right? The sense door of the mind and being outside, you know, where there's, there's sights and sounds and all of that. So just, it felt like, yeah, more in touch with my senses as well, kind of like a more 3D experience as opposed to a 2D of just, you know, yeah, just stories, especially when they're repetitive stories. So it, I think, and maybe this kind of moves into your second question too, because I think the reason that we like our stories is 
in a way because they are more boring in a sense, or I mean, even if they're painful and suffering, but so often they, they can be painful and suffering, but also repetitive and really familiar. Like, yeah, that old story of whatever blame or, and whereas the present moment or, you know, direct experience, yeah, there is, uh, it does take um, some, it does take some fortitude, some safety, yeah, to be that real. Because, um, you know, yeah, again, even if we have a painful sense of self, it's still kind of can feel like, like ground in a way. And when we're mindful, there's a kind of freedom and uh, joy of that ungroundedness, but it, it also comes with some understanding of vulnerability and, you know, that things are kind of unfixed and changing. Um, there's something I didn't get to, but um, Gil Fransdahl, who I'm doing this eight month online course with, um, he had one article where he talked about, I think this point, about how if we overemphasize what's called the three characteristics that when we open to direct experience, it's impermanent or inconstant, changing, it's unreliable because it's inconstant and it's not self in that we don't find um, a fixed kind of separate essence. It's impersonal, it's, which you could also say it's uncontrollable because it's not self just nature. So those are kind of unsettling. And so he makes this point that if we overemphasize those, you know, that it's not always helpful and that we need uh, to cultivate in addition to these insights, we also need to uh, cultivate the men, you know, the kinds of strengths that let us kind of feel okay with them. So like mental stability, for seeing impermanence, like a sense of, you know, okayness and a sense of happiness and well-being for 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 seeing the unreliability of things. And there are practices, you know, metta, definitely, you know, like you were saying, metta is one of the, yeah, I think really essential um, attitudes to feel okay, to feel safe in the world. Um, and it's often talked about as a protection for our own hearts from the tendency to not only feel ill will, but kind of to imagine, you know, uh, Ajahn Suchitta talks about inferred hostility too, even. You know, it's like, it's not just ill will towards others, but it's also just kind of feeling like it's a harsh world, which you know, we can definitely find evidence to support that. But can't we also find evidence to support that we've been offered warmth in our lives, that we've been offered kindness and care? So, you know, just that kind of, yeah, malleability of, um, yeah. Yeah, just that our hearts need need that for sure in order to, Feel like it's okay okay to be here because you know i think when we cultivate metta over a period of time we just feel more trustworthy to ourselves and to others like that yeah some confidence that this that this attitude of wishing well and it really has to start with ourselves um is is available and is really yeah, really functional and really supportive and healing of all the ways that we take on ill will, just often just through, I think, osmosis of just all the, the pain in the world or specific circumstances. But yeah, so just to go back to that, to Gil's teaching, so to open to the unreliability, we wanna cultivate happiness through metta, through dana, generosity, you know, being, being connected, um, and then to open to, to not self, that it's just kind of this wild dance of nature, we also want to have the sense of confidence that 
you know, that there is a, you know, there's a path and that we have the capacity to walk it. So these are kind of paradoxical in a sense, they're kind of the opposites, but, but yet they kind of go together. The more we feel safe, the more we uh, are okay that it's all just kind of changing, unreliable, because we're not looking so much to external conditions to kind of be our, our support. We're more relying on the heart itself. Yeah, thanks for that. So we should leave it here. And I appreciate everyone again for being here. And I think um, Chuck has a few announcements.